Psalm 48 today, we read from verse 12. Psalm 48 and the 12th verse. Walk about in Zion. Go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces. That you may tell it to the generations to follow. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto the end. When I was high school teacher, I uh, stumbled upon a number of stories that I needed to tell my children just to steer something in them when it came to either hearing or speaking the language. And one of the stories I stumbled upon was this. Jim was a very bad soldier. He often was doing dirty works in the kitchen or in the campgrounds while his friends were either eating or having a rest. But he decided to become a good soldier and to do exactly as he was told to do, since that is what is required of men in uniform, or women for that matter. And soon he was put in a group of soldiers whose duty it was to paint army trucks. At some point, one of his senior officers asked him to paint a truck. Warning, desiring to do exactly as he'd been told to do, Jim asked the officer, Which truck do you want me to paint, sir? The officer said, That truck. What color do you want me to paint, sir? Green. And which part of the truck do you want me to paint, sir? Every part, said the officer who was in a hurry. Every part of the truck, sir? Yes, sir! Oh, yes, little man, and don't stop till you're done with painting the whole truck. And in obedience to the senior officer, Jim began to paint the truck dark green. He painted the body of the truck then the windshield and the rest of the windows, <laughs> the tires and the, the lights. When he was finished, he went and painted the inside. So when he was finished, every part of the truck was dark green inside and outside. I don't have to tell you what happened when the senior officer returned. Now we are required, when we listen to God, to listen to God and listen well. To be obedient to God and obedient with all of ourselves and not in part. And how much more must we be obedient when this God gives us instructions not to trap us as Jim was, but to bring us to a place where actually we enjoy with Him the magnificence, glory, the dignity, and wonder in which He Himself lives. And that is what this passage is telling us about. That God unselfish shares with us everything that constitutes him as his majesty. And so when we talk about Zion, we are talking about that dwelling place of God. Where God is happy to be. A place that he wants to call his own. And as many of us acknowledge, there's no place like home. There just isn't. Something crosses my mind which I think I should tell you. When my boys in their formative years Joined my wife and I when we visited a friend of ours who was in charge of certain hotels. And uh, when we went to his home, they didn't say a single thing. But when we came back to our humble home, 
the boy said, Daddy, that nice place we went to, does that man own it? He said, yes, boys, he does own it. It was really nice. Yes, boys, it was really nice. Would you like to move there? No. <laughs> but it's a nice place. No. But why not? And the inference is clear. There is no place like home. Right now, our roof in other vestry, seen from this side, is excellent. But go to the other side. It's not so excellent, is it? <laughs> but let's ask ourselves, if that was the appearance of our own homes, what would we do? Wait for the next 11 years before we address that? <laughs> I doubt it. We would immediately say, I'm going to the bank and I'm giving you no rest until they give me a loan. My insurer, whatever it takes, we will do that to make certain that we get our home looking good. Nothing wrong with that. But I want to say, if we who are called human beings would like to make our homes as homely, as heavenly, as sweet as possible, how much more must God, the Creator, make His home marvelous, unspeakably wonderful? And that's what our God has done. That's what the psalmist pictures. But He only pictures what God has prepared for those He calls His own. It begins with towers, for it says, tell of, of the towers. Now, why is America very happy, proud of its twin, twin towers? They were crashed, but they're up again. I've never seen them, but I hear they're magnificent. See, as they stand high above every other building, America must look and have a sense of pride. It's a, something that stands out. It's above all else. I mean, even when we go to our own Toronto or Vancouver, where we have these towers, even some smaller ones in Halifax, we can see how they just tower above. We feel good that we have such splendor that can speak of the majesty, the glory of our cities. But when we talk about Towers in the divine sense. God is saying to us, He has given us certain treasures. Treasures that we may call truths. Truths that we may keep, keep to ourselves because they tower high above every teaching that the world can bring to bear upon us. We are taught of God. And the things pertaining to God, as no other people ever have been taught, as the children of Israel would say, no people on earth have a God who has appeared to them the way you, our God, have appeared to us. No God has given to any people such commands as you've given to us. So in other words, there is this teaching you've given us, there's this truth you've given us, there's this treasure you've given us, and you've given it to us while we're here on earth, but it speaks well into our friends, something that gives us hope beyond the grave. The Christian truth towers high above any teaching that you can talk about, and that is why it is sickening to see Christian believers who live lives that don't speak the level of teaching that we have when we are taught by God. Here is a simple test. We all have affiliates. We all have acquaintances. We all have friends. We all have affinities. So at whatever level those come, is there a sense in which you tower above those with whom you associate? Is there something in you 
That just tells those that you associate with, there is something I can learn from you. Are you a child? Do your parents sense son, daughter, even though you are birthed by us, yet we want to seek something out of you? In the company of friends, do you find your friends saying, okay, let's turn now and ask the opinion of? There is a sense in which each one of us who behaves ourselves the way God wants us to behave, in the truth that he has called us to, would be like this parliamentarian in one of the English parliaments who would toy around the parliament because he had this ability to win over people whenever he argued. And so when he, he was on this side and this side began to win the debate, he turned and went to the other side. And when they began to win the debate, he turned again and went to the other side. Playing games like that until he, finally he gave his opinion and it would be taken in. Who, whose truth do you hold on to? And how well does it tell? Earth is above heaven. No. Heaven is above earth. And the teaching of heaven, which God gives to us, is above this earth. Is your life above the ordinary person. Think about the word of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, you rubbish, you're not exposing the, the, the God of heaven the way you should. And so he tells his own disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and Sadducees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's the person I ask, is that the kind of tower you are? Are you a symbol of God's Zion? a symbol of God's presence, a revealer of God's presence. For God up there in heaven has citizens on earth for himself, and that citizen is in the name of the one who says, I am a Christian. Are you that tower? But not the second thing. We don't just have the towers. We have the bulwarks. For it says, mark the bulwarks. That's what our text says. If you're going to tell and then you're going to mark. Take note of it. In other words, stay strong. If there is anything unshakable, it's a strong wall. That's why you have the, the, the wall of Jerusalem, the, 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 the big wall of China, and so on and so forth. Walls speak of defense, protection, strength. That's what they talk about. And no soul can be as stable as the one that is taught from the courts of glory, from the courts of heaven. If the truths of God bring into existence humanity, if the truths of God take away pain from suffering humanity, if the truths of God take away heal, heal, what, what is it? illness from those who are ailing, or bring a form of comfort by which they are able to put up with the difficulties of life while they linger on this earth. Then it means in the place where the truth is sourced, no evil, no pain, no disturbance, nothing that hurts is going to ever enter that place. And that is what God's place is like. And we become a little like that when you are on this earth, you belong to our God. For it does say about us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then say, and the peace of Christ will guard your hearts and souls. This is not the peace that the world gives, the peace of God will guard. That's why those walls are put around, to have peace, to have calm, to have comfort, to be sure you're safe with solidity. But no, no, the earth doesn't provide that, but God does provide that. And have you seen a people that in the midst of the turmoils, the, the, the troubles, the pains, the suffering, the anguish, the sadness of this earth, still have something about them that gives them a composure that, if you like, is hard to understand. Ill and yet above the illness. Faced with calamities and yet above the calamity. Tempted in every way 
yet overcoming the temptation. Name every negative thing, yet seeming to find a way out of it all. Oh. How can there be people like that? When you have God as your defense, that is what happens. Let me tell you something which you not only do well, but ask yourself whether you live by it. When we give in to pain and sorrow and anxiety and sin and anything and temptation, it's because we want, not because we don't have enough defense. Nothing evil, nothing sinister ever penetrates the heart of God. And when God is a bulwark, a defender, a wall of, 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 of defense. Who can penetrate us? Not one thing. And God has said, in that place that he calls his dwelling place, only his will, only his word, only his presence, only his power dominates. Are you dominated by that power? Are you dominated by that presence? Are you dominated by that prominence? Making God prominent in you? Are you? Here's the last thought. Count something to do with the palaces. Now don't they speak of splendor? Isn't it wonderful to be invited to I don't know, is this whatever Sussex Street where the Prime Minister lives? And just be told you are going to feast there tonight. <laughs> That's a great thing. But he is a God that invites us into his dwelling place where he, as king, royal, reigns unquestionably, never to be overthrown. Never, even for an instance, to be disrupted in his reign. No. And he says, you can. And you are a part of it. Because he says about those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall reign with him. So it's beautiful. It's sweet. It's serene. It's unspeakably fabulous. And notice how Hebrews puts it. You have come to the place of the spirits of just men made perfect. Of Christ, the mediator of a new covenant. Of a gathering of festal angels. To a place whose builder and architect is God. The mind that is above humanity. The mind that is not physical, but spiritual. And so you come to that which has a magnitude of goodness that cannot be imagined. You know why it talks about Zion, that you have streets of gold, a river of life, a tree of life, and stones of glory. See, it's it just, it's like, 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 because it cannot be described but it's that magnificent. When God gives us his promises, God assures us of his, of his pleasures, and God tells us we'll be protected by his power until we get there. <laughs> Are you set for that place? A place of dignity, as somebody has said, a place of defense, and a place of intense delight. You cannot go there if you don't belong to the God of that place. When did you become God? And how did you become God? There's only one way to God. And that way summed up in one way. Jesus. Have you met him? The towers, the bulwarks, and the palaces.